you prefer left or right? I have no idea. Where do Me women neither. usually sit? On the right side of the, or the on left? On the left. On the, okay, fine. That's where ladies, not That's, women, ladies. Okay. And this is the, the, the area of the heart. That's so right. that's why you asked me to sit here, because on your heart side. Okay, fine. <laughs> I accept. I guess so. I accept. <laughs> um, right, so I don't think Ida needs much in introduction now, especially. Um, but we are thrilled that you've come over from Miami to be with us this sunny Saturday morning. And I'm just going to start to talk to you. Here I am, Good. at your disposal. Right, now... Not everything, but some of it. <laughs> okay, then why don't we start, since you say that, why don't you start with the story you just told me one minute ago <laughs> that happened a few months ago that you got a phone call? Right. <laughs> but, uh, dare I? I think you dare. I think we In have London? mostly adults here, and uh, the children will In London, cope. of all places, <laughs> so conservative... Absolutely. But not anymore. All of that's changed. All, right, All well. these aliens from outer space who come to London these days. Anyway, okay, the story goes like that, that somebody calls me up and said, Ida, there is a gentleman who wants to talk to you on the phone and to date you. I said, excuse me? I have enough boyfriends. I don't need any more. This is <laughs> fine. I'm fine. But they said... No, 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 please allow it and so on. Okay, I said, I'm going to be very generous and, and, and s comply with what everybody wants me to do and so on. So a gentleman comes with a rather foreign accent, and this is in Miami, where there are a lot of aliens around, but he, his voice sounded very, very sort of foreign and heavy. And he said to me, you play the cello? I said, okay, what a beginning. He wants to date me and he doesn't know what instrument I'm playing upon. So I said, well, actually, no. My, the, I, I play the instrument that goes under the chin. Forgive, forgive me, ladies and gentlemen, but I couldn't help it. And this is what I said. That goes under the chin, not between the legs. <laughs> I was horrified at myself. Okay. <laughs> It's shocking. It's ended. I I've finished. I've never heard such a story in all my life, but we'll pass over and go to your innocent early years. Um, so you were born. Sorry? You were born. I guess, I guess in, so. In Chelm? A couple of years ago. A couple of years ago. In Poland. In Chelm. Correct. And your father was a portrait painter. Correct. And do you have any of his portraits? My house is full of painting oh. by my papa and some portraits, but you know, the portraits luckily were actually uh, commissioned by some of the clients and they paid for them occasionally. Not very often because, you know, art is not so popular, especially in those days it was a luxury. So people didn't really have money but my father was a professional portrait painter and artist, and also he painted still life, everything. And occasionally they commissioned and paid for it. So that was the beginning. So you grew up with art. But he wasn't a musician. Well, actually, I believe he was. He was born with music in his spirit, in his soul, in his heart. He wanted to be a musician. He wanted to be a violinist. But in those days, uh, in some of the Orthodox uh, families, they looked down upon anyone wishing to be a, a musician. They said, oh my God, somebody who is Jewish is going to be playing all his or her life at Jewish weddings? Is that a career for a Jewish person? No way. So he was prevented and stopped, and it was very frustrating for him. So then he decided that if he ever gets, he was still a very young man at that time, that if he ever gets married and had a child, that child would be a musician. And it was my sister. Okay, now a little pause. 
<laughs> okay, so you have an older sister. Right. And did she play the violin? I have to yeah, ask. Absolutely. She was the one to play the violin. She was the first and to then play the violin. We've heard, I think, what's even in the program. We heard a story. Can you remember this? That your mother sang a song and you picked up your sister's violin and played it. No, perfectly. You know, it sounds very, how can I put it? Very strange. But I think, uh, I'm not really particularly religious, but I believe in some power that some of us are not even aware of it. But something exists that we have no clue what it's all about. I was really, really three and a half at the time. And my mom was cooking. We were very, very poor. And cooking in the kitchen and singing. So I said, just like very spontaneously, Mommy, I can play what you are singing. So my mama said, no, you can't. You are three and a half. You never did. Leave that violin alone because you might drop it and it will break and we don't have money to buy another one for your older sister, so don't touch it. I said, but I can play. She said, no, you can't. You're only three and a half. I said, but I can. <laughs> and I did. <laughs> Perfectly. Hang on, I thought you said earlier when we were talking that you were taught never to contradict. Perhaps this is where you did contradict that. Well, time. that was when I was only three and a half. I see. Then you I didn't that. learn yet the rules. I see. That's amazing. And was there a local violin teacher, or did your father teach you? My papa? No, he was an artist painter. So, he but didn't teach who taught me. you once you'd. He brought this. me to a teacher who, because of my older sister, who was already being taught by this man in a different city. So, my papa took, uh, you know, the bus, as far as I recall, I don't know, and brought me to this teacher to evaluate my potential. And the teacher said, oh, Mr. Handel, you are now coming to have some violin lessons. He never paid attention. It was a tiny little thought. He, it never occurred to my sister's teacher that I'm the one he was trying to present. So my papa said, well, actually, no, this. He said, OK, forget it. It's three and a half, what are we talking about? So my father said, yes, but she can play. <laughs> the teacher said, no, she can't. She's three and a half. <laughs> but he, my father said, yes, she can. Um, go on and show what you can do. So I did. And the uh, teacher said, well, I'm not going to teach that. She can't read. She doesn't know what it's all about. Let her play from ear, whatever she wants to play, and, and that's it. Let's see further. That was the end of <laughs> this teaching session. We walked away. And? What <laughs> silence. Well, <laughs> there, there waiting a, to hear, presumably. No reaction. Well, uh, there, there is a result from all of that. We Here I that. am. <laughs> with a fiddle beside me. Okay, but we're sort of waiting for the continuation because presumably at some stage you did take some lessons. Did I take? Lessons. Well, uh, my father then, uh, we lived in this very, very tiny little town called Hell and there was nobody really available and also they didn't want to teach me. So I played from my ear, you know, just continued to play all the melodies that, be, uh, that I heard and, and uh, people sang or whatever. And then there was a time, first of all, my father uh, had a very a favorite musician that was, which was his dream for me to meet him and to be taught by this man. And the man's name was Joseph Sigeti. Mm -hmm. So uh, he came to Poland one time and my father brought me to, to meet him and he didn't believe that I was going to be the one to be presented. Everybody thought it was my father that was trying to get lessons. So uh, uh, Sigeti was a little bit impatient and he said, well, I don't have much time to, I, I don't really teach, I just play concerts. But my father said, this is what I want you to hear. <laughs> so I, I played a few bars 
and we stayed with Joseph Sigeti for about two hours. How old were you then? Oh, I was about four or something. <laughs> of course. Oh, already, yes. already mature. Absolutely. An Absolutely. adult. And what could he teach you when you were four? Well, uh, he said, uh, Mr. Handel, uh, bring Ida to Paris one day because this is where I, I reside, where I live, but now I'm going to the United States uh, for a concert tour and just be in touch with me while I'm there and then uh, one fine day in the not too distant future I would be more than ready to take care of Ida. Meanwhile, he said, I know somebody who could look after her, a very intelligent musician in Switzerland. And his name was, I remember until this day, of course, uh, Professor Studer. My father thought it over and then he said, that was not what I was dreaming of. I don't want any Studer for my little child. I wanted Sigeti. If I don't get Sigeti, I'm prepared to wait until Sigeti is ready. So we did not go to Switzerland. Also, there was a financial problem because it was expensive to travel to Switzerland from Poland, etc. So I remained without anybody and just played until this day. You never really studied. What about, um, there was some Flesh. Mikhailovitz? No, Mikhailovitz. No, that was, you know, just a very brief uh, uh, kind of acquaintance. And I was a terrible, terrible cheat. I deceived everybody. I could not read, I couldn't write, and I couldn't read music. Oh. So I cheated because when I listened, I was capable of copying and imitating everything I heard, and people, musicians. I even deceived, do you know who I deceived? Not yet. Not yet. <laughs> True revelations. The very famous uh, teacher, Professor Karl Flesch. When I came to study with Flesch, he thought I knew everything about scores and music, etc. Do you know that I played Kreutzer Sonata? for Karl Flesch by Mr. Beethoven. And Flesch did not detect that I heard that I was really playing just what I heard and not capable of reading the notes. Gosh. That okay. was who I was. Can you imagine? That Unbelievable. That is amazing. And how what old a were cheat. you then? What a cheat. What a cheat. I'm shocked again. <laughs> um, okay. How old were you then? I must have been already five. Five? Okay. <laughs> We're getting close to the present. You see? Um, <laughs> okay. And then, but by seven, is this right? You won the Huberman competition. Did I? That's what it says on Wikipedia. <sighs> well, can you imagine? There was a competition for children up to the age of 15 because of I was underage. Uh, I was not allowed. And I think at that time, you had to be 14 to have a working permit. Under 14, you were not allowed to, to have a wage at all. And here I was barely 10, I was nine or so. So uh, Mr. Holt said to my papa, Mr. Handel, we have to concoct a lie and to say that she is actually that age, but for publicity purposes, we are going to deny it. There was no choice. So I was immediately within half an hour aged by about four or five years. Because <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you were nine, they'd advertised the nine-year-old prodigy and then suddenly right. you were 14. 14, but I could get away with it. Thank God I looked old. You do not now, but you did then. <laughs> you <laughs> are a perfect difference? gentleman, thank you. <laughs> this is I'm what just, we I'm not a cheat. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, so hang on, we're going back to Poland now. Poland, yes. Or should we? No. Okay, so you won this Huberman competition. Right. And could you read music by then? Absolutely not. I'm still trying to learn now. <laughs> uh, you know, Stephen, I'm going to say something which is maybe risky and outrageous, but I'm going to say it. We never finished learning. It's an eternal education. If we talk about music, Every day, it's a day of discovery. 
I think I know my score and comes tomorrow and I see I don't. So the conclusion is, who were these composers? Were they really such geniuses that we cannot reach that level ever? Yes. Mm. I guess so. I think so too. Mm. All right, it. since we started talking about such things, why don't we have a, a little bit of music? And this is a recording of you playing the opening of the Beethoven concerto. But I mean, can, can you specify the age? How old do you think I was? It was done after the war, so you must have been um, already three. ten. All right. How old were you? With Kubelik. With Kubelik, I was ten. You were ten. Hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Let's hear okay. it. Let Let's find out. Let's find out by by listening. Say you were ten then? You can't be. That's not a ten-year-old. What can I say? I don't. No know. comment. No <laughs> comment. All right. Um, oh, that's wonderful. Um, and that was Kubelik. But we'll talk about that later. Um, let's go back. And you also went. Is it a Vinyaski competition you went? Where was Jeanette Neve and Hasid and Oystrak and and you were how old then? You were. It's still incredibly young, and yet you got a prize, even though you were playing again. Oystrak was 27. Correct. <laughs> and you were seven. Well, you know nine. who was at that competition that I will really never forget. It was the first Vinyavsky competition in Warsaw, and uh, my father wanted me to participate. He brought me to uh, even uh, to Carflesh to have a little bit of preparation. But uh, that's another story. What I wanted to emphasize about my debut in, in England, that I had the privilege, people don't realize it, to play with one of the best English conductors. Mm -hmm. Were you going to ask me about that or am I? I'm open to anything. Pardon, may I'm I? open to anything. May I? May I? You may, it's allowed. Sir Thomas Beecham. He was great, wasn't he? And when he saw me, he didn't realize, uh, he knew my name probably, you know, because from advertising and so, so then he said, I will never forget his comment when he said, oh my God, the next thing will be I'm going to conduct for Babes in Arms or something like that. <laughs> What's going on here? <laughs> and he was at the Wienowski competition? No, 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 no. That That's was my, my English debut when uh -huh. I played Mozart. Imagine Thomas Beecham conducting Mozart Wonderful. for me, a uh, Mozart concerto, and I think it was the one in A major. That's and you also played with Henry Wood. I did. That was uh, the Brahms. Yeah. Absolutely. And may I, may I brag? Please. Is it allowed? That's why we're here. Am I allowed to brag? <laughs> You're allowed to brag. Imagine, unbelievable though it seems to be, I was invited three times to play the proms, and everybody, I had the worst enemies. They said, what is that? Why such a privilege? We are just barely receiving an engagement for one concert, and here's this, this, this little villain playing three times. So I had a lot of animosity from the other. But probably a lot of admiration as well. I have no idea. Nobody no. ever expressed that to me, but uh, all, a lot of... Uh, that, I feel, is a little hard to believe. Well, there it is. <laughs> I think you got <laughs> quite a lot of praise. That's great. And um, so hang on. So you did amazingly in this Wieniawski competition, and then you went to Flesh full-time? Yes, yes. My father wanted me to study actually 
with, as I already mentioned, I hope Mr. Flesh, Professor Flesh, will forgive this revelation, but I have to be honest. His dream was always Joseph Sigeti, but Sigeti was still busy touring. And when uh, my father brought me to Paris, Sigeti said, look, I can't uh, stay because I, I have an engagement to go on a concert tour to the United States of America. But stay put and then I'll come a few weeks of a month or two months later, then I will uh, really be busy with Ida and I promise to teach her, etc., etc. But there came this very important Wieniawski competition in Warsaw, in which my father wanted me to participate. So he said, well, who is going to take charge of Ida? I've got somebody, I need somebody to prepare her for that competition. So somebody said, Karl Flesch is here. He's a very good teacher, very respected and respectable and so on. So my father brought me to Karl Flesch and Flesch agreed to prepare me and that was, my destiny was already made. And Karl Flesch, you came to him in London, right? Uh, yes, later. During when the, <laughs> just before the war broke out, mm -hmm. uh, Flesch, I can't remember really. I have to consult my autobiography now. <laughs> <laughs> you can afford a copy. Yes, it yeah, well, I probably have one. Good, good. Yeah, I'm glad but you have may one. I say, I had the privilege that my autobiography, my first autobiography, was actually published in London by Victor Golant. That's great. Is this wonderful? It's wonderful. And of now it sells the, for 100 pounds plus. Oh, on mm. All the nations in the world where I travel, London is the one. That's my home. Quite right. Well, that in Miami. Sorry. But you live in Miami. <laughs> I don't have an American nationality. Okay, sorry. I'm London is your home. And I, I was sit corrected. By Her Majesty here. Okay. Did okay. I mention it? You just did. I did. Okay. <laughs> what a faux pas. <laughs> okay. All right. So you. I'm proud of it. You studied with Flesh in this amazing class, All right? Um. Yes, I, I went to Flesh and uh, then became his student. And by then you could read music. By then, no. Still not. No, I cheated. But when did he, you learn to read music? Never, well, very recently. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm still not sure that I can. Okay. Well, as we already agreed, Stephen, the greatest genius. Okay, we do the best we can for the composer, right? Up to a point. But it's still the composer that I bow and I kneel in front oh, of. Of course. What can I say? But still, you have to read what they've written. <laughs> yeah. I would have thought. <laughs> exactly. Um, okay, now talking of the flesh class, let's just have a yes. little bit of music. And this is not you, but I just found it as I was actually looking for your Sibelius this morning, which I couldn't find as oh, I okay. rushed out. Um, let's have somebody else from the flesh class that is not you and see how you, how you like this. Oh. Mm. It'll come. <laughs>
who that was? Well, first of all, may I say this is not the Sibelius Violin Concerto. Well spotted. <laughs> <laughs> this is the Gluck. Oh, it's a gorgeous melody from Orpheus. It's such a beautiful melody. But somehow I can hear that you would get on well with this person. That's why I thought. You mean with the performer? Yes. I would. Do you, I would. Do you know who it was? It was a fellow student of yours in flesh. Mm, first of all, I would say that it's a very fine sounding mm. fiddler, mm. fiddling around. And it's very acceptable, nice sound, intonation, everything. As far as interpretation is concerned, well, we have different views you on do. certain things, which is allowed. I mean, that's why we are individual people who don't do what the other one is doing, that's right? That's true. Unless we want to copy. But it's a fine player. It's somebody you liked, I know, at the somebody time. Somebody I like. So I should tell you, it's Jeanette Neveu. Ah. And she was in the class with you. Yes. So, I mean, it must have been an amazing class. Yes. Wow. But I have to confess, I would not have recognized the oh. playing. Really not. And it's really, I, and I would, I'm going to be very honest. Mm -hmm. uh, it's more refined than I uh, remembered. Mm -hmm. You know, the vibrato is uh, r very fine, and I thought that she had a wider vibrato. Mm -hmm. What my memory, as my memory serves me, I didn't remember that very uh, small, tiny, discreet vibrato, yes. which is very appropriate. For that I like it. <laughs> I like it. That's interesting. You but too, don't you? I do. That's yes. why it sort of reminded me of but you But did somehow. you ever, forgive me for asking, Stephen, now it's for my own uh, benefit and curiosity. Mm -hmm. Did you ever hear her live or only on mm, recordings? She died about a few years before I was born. Otherwise, oh. I would have. My father did, though. In fact, he heard her about two days before she died. You know, she died really? in a plane crash. Really? And it, took him a, it took him years to get over the shock. Mm -hmm. Well, may, may I reminisce a little bit? That's why we're here. Okay, wonderful. So, there I was <coughs> in Paris coming to the class of Carl Flesch, and I was still, uh, of course, a child prodigy. All of a sudden, the door opens, and in walks a, what I thought was a female. wasn't sure. <laughs> Tremendous, uh, presumably, lady, tall, with such a neck, and tremendous hands, and you know, I was a baby, a child. So I buried my face. I remember this distinctly. I wrote about it also in my autobiography. I buried my face in my father's arm because I wanted to giggle. And I said, what is this going to show? And then she attacked. This is the only way I can define that kind of impact. She attacked the F sharp minor Vinyavsky concerto. Well, I stopped smiling. It was such a tremendous impression. It was a volcano. You, you, know, you, know, you know the beginning of the Vinyavsky? I do not, I'm afraid. You don't? You I'm know. sorry. Of course you do. I used to. You do. And that was such an impact. I, I really stopped smiling. I said, oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. Yep. I remember you. That and says it all. Oh my goodness, and Hasid was there, and you were there. I mean, I cannot imagine this class. Did you sort of all play for each other? And yes. It must have been amazing. And what could he teach you all? Fascinating. Absolutely fascinating. fascinating. And Ibri and everybody. But yeah. what could Flesh teach you? I have to say that Flesh was, although he had the reputation of being very severe, and I hope he will forgive me, at times very brutal. He did not protect any of his students. He just spoke what he thought and what he felt, and some, dare I say, dare I remind some, something which is really very tragic. I remember, and I remember the name of that student who committed suicide. Oh. 
because of that frustration. He thought everybody told him he was Dutch, and F Flesch was so outspoken that, sorry, I hope he will forgive me for even mentioning it, because I never got over it. Mm -hmm. He was extremely kind to me, Karl Flesch, only praise and kissing on the forehead and so on, so I was very lucky. But that poor boy felt the brunt of it all, and he couldn't take it, because everybody praised him. All of a sudden, Flesch came and told him maybe the truth. I don't know. So. One has to be careful. Yes, I apologize for that memory, but it's part of yep. the revelation. That's sobering. Yeah. Um, okay, so you're in this amazing class of flesh, and yes. then where did, you, where did you spend the war years? Well, our life was saved. Here we were, and here am I, right now. This is my country, mm, great. with great pride and affection, and I was honored by the government and Her Majesty and so on. What can I say? I'm very loyal. A lot of people, I live in, in America for many years, and they all ask me, where is your American nationality? Well, maybe there is some part that I feel I live in the United States, but my heart is right here at the Weaver Hall. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, when did you make your debut here? And when, but you said you made your, your recital debut at the Queen's Hall. You are not asking me to reveal the year. No, I'm not. Thank you. I'm absolutely, I wouldn't dream of it. I wouldn't, um, okay, I wouldn't, let me rephrase this. I wouldn't uh, tell you. <laughs> I wouldn't tell you. We okay. women are very cunning, and you know, you know that. Okay. Okay, at some stage, Sorry, you, you played, um, you gave a recital here. Um, yes, I gave recital, but you know, to everybody's surprise, most of the people who started the career and uh, made their debut was right here. And for some strange reason, I, I still don't know why, uh, Harold Holt, my very first manager, arranged the, the, my debut at the Queen's Hall. Well, it was bigger, much bigger. Yes, So that absolutely. could explain it. Yes, ah. but it was a great privilege, and I, I brag about it until this day. I didn't appear at the Wigmo Hall. I appeared at the best, big, enormous concert hall, Queen's Hall, as a little tot. As a little tot, it's amazing. And, um, okay, so you spent the war years here. Yes, yes, And yes. then after In the Blitz, hiding in the underground every single night with the little pillow and, and, and the blanket and lying on that stone floor with my papa, mama, and my older sister. This is where I spent the war years. Right. And your blitz. violin? Sorry? And your violin? It was somewhere around, oh. but I didn't have the thread. Uh -huh. No, so nobody could step on it, <laughs> you know, because everybody was walking. So the, the fiddle was safe but it was not a very valuable one. Oh. So it was okay. <laughs> but I, I had a very kind, wonderful man, Hill and Sons, who, who lent it to William Hill. Oh, Hill. William Hill. Hill, Hill and Sons, H -I -L -L. yes. H-I-L-L. Ah, yes, I, I do know the name. Right. <laughs> Imagine, there was this first, the, that gentleman, his name was, I think, Albert Phillips. Mm -hmm. Hill. He was a son-in-law. Ah. He married into the family. Did you know that, Stephen? Uh, no, but I do you now. You see, I'm revealing part of the history. It's true. So there it was, and he very kindly lent it to me without charge, and he said, okay, he said it to my papa, either can play on that instrument. He hesitated about allowing me to travel you know, in the rest of the world, because he was uh, afraid that I, you know, something could happen. Yeah. But it was, uh, you know, my father paid the insurance for it, which was, you know, anyway, very generous, and I, I used that violin. That's good. And, and the French bow. And the French bow. And when did you acquire this one? Very recently. Oh. About a year ago. <laughs> Seriously? 
I'm playing a few years on this one. Yeah, I see. <laughs> You're joking. But I'm not going to say who built it. That's a secret. Who Just built it? <laughs> silence. Just a very ordinary Italian, some kind of a Biden maker. Sort of Cremonese. Who cares? Oh, they're awful, those things, but they're cheap. Yes. Um, all right, so why don't we have some more music? Actually, could we have, like, this is something written down the order here, a bit of the Brahms concerto. Performed by who? It's you again. It's all oh you my, from oh, now. How boring. I wouldn't say so. Let's hear a bit of it, maybe shortly before the violin comes in. This is from my personal collection. Sorry, I switched order on Darius. That was a bit mean. Well, I'm, maybe I'm still practicing <laughs> out there, <laughs> preparing. <laughs> So tell her that was with Sergio Celibidache and the London Symphony Orchestra. How did you meet Celibidache? It was actually in Mexico City. And I already had a favorite conductor by that time, mm -hmm. who happened to be a man from Prague, Czechoslovakia, and his name was Rafael Kubelik. So when I came to Mexico and somebody said to me, oh, there is a conductor here who, that we admire very much, I said, oh, forget it. <laughs> who cares? I, I, I only know one whom I admire so much, and that's Rafael Kubrick. They said, well, that may be as, as, as it is, but maybe you can listen to this man. So I was brought to a concert by a strange-looking individual who I had seen before on a photo, and to me he then looked very weird, had jet black hair all over the place, fairly long, and I said, well, who is this wacky looking individual? So they said, well, come on and listen. Well, I really, my mouth dropped when I saw him and heard him, I said, well, He's not too bad. <laughs> then, uh, what happened next, I had a recital in Mexico. Uh, no, yes, it was in Mexico uh, the first time. I had a recital because uh, nobody in Mexico knew me well enough to dare and to risk inviting me to play with an orchestra. So I played that recital, and that strange individual, Sergio Celibidaki, came to the concert. At once, his personality became what it really was, very strong. He comes into my audience and says, you should never present yourself in the recital. You should play with an orchestra. I said, oh my God, but who's going to invite me with an orchestra if they don't know what I can do on that violin? I am. Tomorrow you're going to play Beethoven concerto with me. Gosh. Excuse <laughs> me? Just like that, unprepared, yes. That's what happened. I played tomorrow the Beethoven with Sergio Celibidake. I, I thought I would like to faint, but I said, no, I'm going to control my fainting spell and play, and I did. And it was wonderful? I have no idea, I think so, maybe, <laughs> maybe. Okay, but the orchestra, I mean, you don't think Mexico is producing the world's greatest orchestras, but he But he did you it. see, there you are. You know, he was very weird, if I may borrow that expression. You may borrow it. We don't use it in England, do we? Weird? Yes, we definitely do. We do. We even are. Now we do, <laughs> now we do. 
he was very weird. He wanted to experiment with mediocre orchestras. He never tried to play, uh, to conduct one of the great orchestras. He said, probably to himself, that is the test and that's the achievement. If I can create out of nothing something wonderful. That's what he did. Mm -hmm. He went to Mexico and, and took some of the, uh, they were amateurs almost. And he tried to recreate and make them into virtuosi. And he did it. And he did. He did. Amazing. It was quite amazing. I mean, there is no doubt we had some wonderful English conductors mm -hmm. also that I really enjoyed working mm -hmm. with. Contrary to what some people thought that he was so uh, brutal sometimes and not very kind, Sir Malcolm Sargent. Really? Yes. Mm. He was so nice to me, contrary to what people thought, and I played with all of them. And of course, Sir Thomas Beecher. Mozart. I had the privilege. That's Can you great. imagine? I love Beecher's conduct. It's funny because we think of him for his witticisms, but actually. Yes, exactly. He was <laughs> but he a was a wonderful musician. Mozart interpreter. Maybe until this day, absolutely unique. And, you know, underrated was somebody that I thought was a very good, uh, I don't want to use that word because there is no such thing as accompaniment. Mm. We are all creating and we are all producing and so on. Basil Cameron. Oh, gosh. That's a name from 78 records. I used to see it but spinning you, round and did, round. Did you ever hear him, Stephen? On no. records? Oh, I see. On records? Um, no. Never? I don't think so. He was Basil very good professional. Oh, very, very, he, very professional. He knew Is that his, a compliment? No, but really, he knew his metier. Mm -hmm. You were safe. I don't think anything could ever go wrong with Basil Cameron. It may not have been the most inspired kind of performance. Okay, mm -hmm. he was not Nikish, maybe he was not uh, one of the greatest artists, but very reliable. And I really, I felt safe. Mm, that's good. But Celebidaki was your absolute favorite. You did everything with him, right? All the major repertoire? Yes. I was really privileged mm -hmm. that he wanted to conduct everything. But he was also, what was amazing to me until this day, critical that he was of everyone. Do you know, Stephen, and I'm not bragging, I swear, not one word of protest. Whatever I did on that fiddle, he followed. Never one criticism to say, uh, not even like that. Ida, why don't you ch change that interpretation a little bit? Maybe, did you think about uh, uh, performing it this way or interpreting it this way? Never. Is this believable? Yes. I, I would never dare argue with you, but of course I'm not telling it out here. <laughs> oh, really? Mm. I'm so scary that you, no, you wouldn't you're say just a force. no contradiction, whatever I said? Wouldn't dare. Well, I did contradict you the first time we met. Oh. Because I came backstage. I heard your wonderful Wigmore Hall recital. But. And I there said. There was a but. Yeah, there was a but. I said, um, <laughs> hello, Miss Handel. Um, I'm Stephen Isselis. And you said, you're not. Ah. And that I felt I had to contradict. <laughs> so I was the one. Yeah. Are you sure that I, I, I might say it now? No, I see one are you, are you? I'm pretty sure. Who you I looked are? at my passport okay. yesterday. <laughs> um, you also played with, of course, our Simon Rattle. Sir Simon. Simon Rattle. You played a lot with him. Yes. He loves you deeply. Yes, yes. I he's, adore Simon. He's wonderful. have to admit. Yes, a wonderful, a wonderful representative of this country he is. and a nice person too so modest and charming i mean i have nothing but praise That's for cool. simon and now That's he special. has quite a good orchestra behind <laughs> him it's not bad not bad at all um but you know i i, I think i have to uh, i think i have to do something about that to talk to my manager oh. didn't get the invitation from him um, you know? Yeah, well, maybe not. Yes. Maybe not. Oh, oh, there's always tomorrow. There's always tomorrow. Scarlett O'Hara. I sort always always. quote her. Um, I always quote Scarlett O'Hara. Always tomorrow. Always tomorrow. Frankly, dear, I give a damn.
Right. <laughs> um, <laughs> okay. Um, I don't say pianists. that. You know, that's too risky. Oh, I, I could be arrested. It's true. Okay. And pianists, you've played, well, I know you've played because we did the Beethoven Triple together with Martha Argerich, yes. who also loves you. But she's not English. No, she's not English. That's so? true. But Is she's she a pianist. forgiven? She's forgiven and okay. she's a pianist. And well, you played a lot with her, haven't you? From time to time, yes. But, you know, for, she had a favorite uh, violinist. You know? Every. Oh. Yes. So I didn't want to interfere. Ah, I, I let it go. I well, said, I okay. played with you both. It's my loss, but what can you, you can't have everything in but life. But she loves you deeply. And she came and she did that Beethoven triple. Yes. And yes. Yes. yes, we did that. But, but I, I love Marta, and I don't know whether she loves me, maybe not. She does, I can tell you. you really? I okay. Have it from the horse, well, I'm she's not really a horse, but I have it from her mouth. Anyway. Oh, really? But really. she's so talented. <laughs> <laughs> Suddenly. Um, but do you know that I played with an English pianist? Ivor Newton? No, it oh. was a woman. I don't think he was... Myra Hess? Uh, no, I didn't no. play with Myra Hess, but... I played with, uh, of course, I, I knew her. I had the privilege to meet Myra Hess. But there was also another one. And I, I'm not sure whether she had the, uh, the actual nationality. Yes, of course she was. Mora Limpony. Oh. How about good old Mora Limpony? Anyone knows the name? Yeah. <laughs> you recall the name? There you uh, are. She was a what character about and a half. A talented moral lady. She was scary. <laughs> <laughs> when I met her, she was terrifying. But uh, really? Yes, but maybe not to you. But you, you met her? Just once. Okay, but a very, very fine pianist. I remember that. Great. And I played with another one, with, uh, who I also knew, but very sort of briefly. There was a female, I don't think she was British, Clara Haskell. She was not British, but she, she was, was great. But what? she was good. I didn't know. In spite of that. <laughs> in spite of that. In spite yes. of not being British. Yeah. These are wonderful uh, people. Yes. You. And when I saw her, she was already like that. And she walked onto that stage limping. And I said, well, can she still play? She went to that piano and I th she played the Chopin concerto. Amazing. You see, I just had I just played in in uh, America, and the title of the uh, review was "What has age to do with it?" <laughs> I'm very proud of that. That's very the very good. latest one. I'm not saying the last one, but that's what <laughs> the critics said. <laughs> what has age to do with it? And that related to Clara Haskell. Uh, yeah. I received a letter from Jean Sibelius in which he says. Ida Handel, I congratulate you upon your performance of my concerto, but, but, there is a but, I congratulate myself much more for having, can you imagine, from the composer, much more for having found a soloist of your rare standard. That's something, something one would carry around. Amazing. Amazing. But I have one, one problem that I'm very frustrated. Beethoven never wrote to me anything. <laughs> no brass. No manners. Can you imagine? So unappreciative. Uh, exactly. <laughs> but Dalla Piccola. But yeah. I, will, I will have a, a talk with him one of these days. Trust 50 me. years from him. Trust me. We, we women are absolutely nothing to deter us from speaking our mind, right? Well, I think... You're a fairly extreme example of that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank say. you. And Dalla oh. Piccola you worked with? Sorry? Didn't you work with Dalla Piccola? Dalla Piccola. Yes, yeah. yes. I had the privilege to premiere his work. And was that wonderful? Well, it was very, very kind of scary mm -hmm. in his presence. And again, as I said, Brahms never asked me to premiere his concerto. Very frustrating. But Dalla Piccola, yes. And I had the approval. So I feel That's safe. Good. He did not complain. Or maybe he was very polite. I don't know. I'm sure he was being honest. Do you not think so? Cheating. I'm yeah. sure. So. Well, you know, I'm a very kind of, how can I put it, arrogant person. 
I always believe what people tell me. <laughs> especially well, if, it, especially if it's positive. <laughs> <laughs> When you were 14? I was 14. I then I was also 14. <laughs> <laughs> I heard that there's a civilian smiling in the church with people burgling with the, with the SNO in 1970 something. And I was absolutely stunned. I had never, as a schoolboy, I was struggling with really sick violin. And I'd never seen anybody play the violin like that before. And it made a tremendous impression. <coughs> and whenever I hear any other violinists, yeah, they're okay, but they need to handle. But what I wanted to ask you, Ms. Handel, is that I think your own thing goes up to about the 70s. Do you have any plans to write another volume to, to update it? About what? About yourself. <laughs> volume two of your... You okay, sorry, you probably can't hear. What he's asking no, is... No, let me, let me answer that. You really want more information about me? Well, True well, revelations? Well, even more? Absolutely. It could be very, very... Scary. Who knows? <laughs> you might be very disappointed. Well, I was thinking, I mean, I, I have a little thing to do with the Peter Sneaking Churchill, which I find very, which I, and I just wondered what, what it was like working with, with, with somebody like him, or people playing the Peter Sneaking Churchill. Peterson. Peterson. The composer. Peterson. The composer. Apparently, this gentleman heard has a recording of the Peterson concerto. Yes, Patterson. Patterson. Oh, Patterson. Patterson. Ah, Patterson concerto. Patterson concerto. And so the first question was: Is Ida going to well, write? Well, I, I really was asked to premiere it, and it was, I have to tell you, very complex, very difficult for the orchestra. They hated me. Everybody hated me after that for, you know, for playing it. It's so complex for the orchestra. It's not easy, it's not easy. And then everybody avoided it. And I'm very sorry because I enjoyed, you know, I enjoy things which are, how can I put it? Complex and challenging. What's the point of doing everything that's easy? The challenge until this day is what is exciting about everything in life. Okay, I, okay. I finished. Next question, please. There is one. <laughs> You've silenced them. Silence. Yes. Uh, Hendel, are you still performing uh, recitals or concertos? Is Ida still performing recitals and concertos? I know the answer is yes. You know, there is one word that I always I, can I be honest? You can. Well, why stop May now? I? <laughs> yes. Which I resent a little bit, and I'm going to. I'm being asked all the time. That's one little word which upsets me immensely. People say to me, "Are you still playing?" <laughs> <laughs> it kills me. It kills me. So every time I have to show that I'm still playing. Big. Still. Well, you're about to. Can we erase it from the whole vocabulary <laughs> that still, when it relates to me, yeah. Stephen, it's am important. I allowed to eliminate you, it? You, in your case, yes. Thank you. I can't <laughs> imagine you without a violin. I remember. I mean, Ida, and I, Ida embarrassed me unbelievably about the summer before last. What did I we do? We both played in a concert. Ida played the Carmen Fantasy and I played Haydn D. This was at a festival in America, New York State. And then, for some reason, we couldn't find a restaurant. It was very late, so we ended up in a 24-hour diner. Uh -huh. And we had sort of, you know, there were tables full of bikers and things who were sort of there. And for some reason, I mentioned the Schumann D minor sonata that I don't know it very well. And Ida said, do you want to know how it goes, Stephen? I said, well, yes. So she took out her violin, and for the next 20, 20, 30 minutes in this diner with these bikers sitting there, these sort of drunken students, you played to me, you fixed me. I felt like I was 
a sort of, you know, in a python's gaze, you looked at me and played like, I must say, my sister Annette saw the photo of this and she had hysterics for at least 10 minutes. She said she'd never seen me look so uncomfortable. <laughs> she was, my but apology. I did get to know the Schumann D minor sonata, so my that was apology. good. My apology, my apology. But did you love the sonata? I did. They did. You Even the bikers loved the sonata, I think. <laughs> they all applauded you in the end. Even the bikers? Well, they all applauded well, that's you. that's a real success. What and a triumph. Yes. So anyway, since there don't seem to be many more questions. Oh, there is a question. Do you have a favourite piece that you continue to want to play? Or are there pieces that you think you've played so often you don't want to play them anymore? Music is eternal. Does this answer the question? I think very succinctly. As long, you know, I have to say, am I religious? <laughs> I don't know. I believe in the power, like my parents did. We were not particularly religious. We don't go to a temple every uh, holiday. We don't go to the synagogue. We don't go to the church and so on. But we have the church and the temple in our heart, and we have to continue that. So I believe that there is a power that we are probably not even aware of, and that's the mystique of it, which I think is absolutely amazing. And we have to believe in it. So as long as God will give me the, both the mental and the physical strength, I will try to continue. That's my answer. <laughs>